Greetings. Um, I just wanted to finish up some of my thoughts on the reading for this week. Again, we're reading um, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. And the other thing I want you to read is Christine de Pizan's uh, excerpt from Letter to the uh, Letter from the God of Love. Christine de Pizan is uh, born in 1364. She dies in 1430. Um, she's most well known for her work, um, Book of the City of Ladies, and and as we're going to read this week, the Letter from the God of Love. Um, she she's a member. She's 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 actually born in in Italy. She's Venetian by birth, but she lives in the court of King Charles the Fourth of France, and most of what she writes during her lifetime is written in in French. Um, and I just, in the excerpt I have, I want you to read for this week, I just have a few things I want to touch on. Um, I think Christine de Pizan is very interesting because in some ways she's kind of one of the earliest literary critics or literary feminist critics, we might say. Um, and in, in this brief excerpt I have you read, she's making a number of kind of important interventions about how women are represented in literature. Um, also, she's promoting social change for women and also making this this argument about women that they are not inclined toward cruelty and that God created women without transgressions. Um, but some of the representational interventions she makes are she, she points out that women are prone to love deceivers when they're represented in, rep represented in a book of um, in a work of literature. But it's because she she points out it's because men are the authors of these books. Um, she also says that if women are easily manipulated, why do men need to use tricks to deceive them? And oftentimes women are also represented as very fickle or having desires um, that kind of move from one one thing to the next. Um, but again, her point is that women are not right representing women in this way. Women are not writing the books where women are represented in this way. Um, and she offers all these examples where women are represented kind of loving false men, like in classical literature, like Medea, who falls in love with Jason, or Dido, as we read this semester, who falls in love with Aeneas. And as we know, Aeneas leaves Dido, right? Um... She also here promotes this idea that women should be defended by men always because women nourish their sons, because all men are brought up by women during this time period. She sees that as an argument for um, why women should basically be respected at all times. And again, she's responding to a very kind of specific um, audience of of uh, religious writers during this time who have these very sexist ideas about what women should do in society and where their place is. So she's responding to that, but she's also responding to um, the literature that is available to her during this time, which again is, she's responding to critics, uh, um, I'm sorry, authors who are writing in their own moment, but also all these authors that we've been reading going all the way back to the classics including, um, you know, Sophocles or Ovid. <clears throat> and again, the reason I think she's important is because she's kind of introducing these questions that, that make us think about the place of women in literature differently. And I, basically this week, I would just encourage you to kind of think about how these arguments, how her arguments, how what she's proposing here stand up against some of the female characters we've encountered this semester. So first and foremost, there's Allison from um, the Miller's Tale in the Canterbury Tales. Um, again, how is she being represented here? Is she being represented by Chaucer, a male author, as deceitful? Um, and if so, is that because Chaucer is, is to blame for kind of thinking of women in that way? Um, again, all, all of the things that we've read this semester have been written by men, ex with the exception of the, the two 
tales by Marie de France. And interestingly, I would argue that, again, as I think I mentioned in that lecture, Marie de France is thinking about women in kind of these different roles in those stories. We talked about how um, in Landval, for example, it's, it's the queen who comes and kind of rescues the knight at the end rather than the knight rescuing the damsel, right? And um, in Laustick, the story about the nightingale, uh, the woman isn't like consummating her, her love or, or necessarily even cheating on her husband in, a, in an explicit way, but it's this more kind of subtle. Um, it, it's written in a way where you kind of feel empathy for the woman, for the, the female character, um, a lot more than if it had been written, maybe if it had been written from a, a male perspective. Um, but we might also think about this question with Shakespeare, right? The women represented in, in Midsummer Night's Dream, um, are they, are they being represented as easily manipulated? Um, are they being represented as fickle? Are they being represented as deceitful? Um, and, and, or, or is something else going on there? Similarly with Cabestan's lover, Nicolosa, and the innkeeper's wife, the hunchback's wife, and the wife in the wild dream in um, the works of Boccaccio that we read. There's also all of the female characters in from Ovid, many of whom are um, figures from classical literature, um, obviously. And then, of course, Lysistrata and Antigone and his many um, from the, the plays that we read earlier this year. Um, so just keep that in mind, just some, some food for thought for this week. Um, yeah. And I hope, I hope you guys enjoy and appreciate Christine de Pizan and, and try to think about her in response to, to Chaucer because they are, um, contemporaries of one another. Okay. Thank you.